Hello YouTube, it's Balthazor3457, and in this video we'll be doing something a little different. So when I originally made this channel, I had a rule of no political or social videos. However, I broke that rule during the whole Sopa and Pippa incident. The Sopa and Pippa video was well received, but I had broken the rule I set up. There was now a political video on my channel. That seems to be a taboo for a lot of channels, especially ones related to gaming, and yet my Sopa and Pippa video got quite a positive response. That made me wonder if the reluctance to talk about social or political issues is a little bit out of place. So we're going to do an experiment. This video will be the first of my sociological and political videos that I plan to make, as of me officially making this a variety channel of both game stuff and sociological stuff. Now, I understand that with having an opinion comes controversy, and that's especially going to be true in my case, because I side with neither American major political party. I'm neither a Republican nor a Democrat, and by just saying that and not being fiercely loyal to one of these two parties, I've already alienated and lost part of my audience from both, which I otherwise would have had grow in size. But, I currently make no money from my YouTube videos, so I have less to lose for this experiment, whereas other commentators may have their livelihood depend on appeasing the audience. So that puts me in a unique position. Let's see how this plays out. Is there a market for a channel that mixes gaming content in addition to real-life issues? Maybe there is. I suppose we'll see. Now, the rest of this video is going to be an introduction to what you'll see from me in general. You'll find a lot of George Carlin-esque views for starters, but I told you that I'm neither a Republican nor a Democrat, so you may be wondering, well, what the hell am I? If I had to have some sort of political alignment, it would be closer to the ideas of the original Founding Fathers of the United States, and they were mostly independents who hated political parties. So that's political alignment, or the closest thing I have to one. So philosophically, what am I? I can't just call myself a Balthazor 34570-ian, so what's the closest? I'm not really anything. What I most have in common with would be a meritocrat. The concept in a nutshell is leadership by merit. Whoever is the best leader should be the leader, whatever works best should be used, but you should keep experimenting and looking for new ways to keep improving the system. And that's what this video is right now, an experiment, because I want to see what will happen. Now that's still too vague, there are different types of meritocrats with conflicting ideals. Some meritocrats argue that performance on aptitude tests and academic grades should determine one's place in an organization. I disagree with this on the grounds of tests being given unreasonably inflated value and our educational system being flawed to the extent that the academic system doesn't produce reliable results anyway. I favor meritocracy by displayed merit, not by academic merit. A video game analogy would be, if someone is really good at blowing up tanks, maybe he should be the one to be tasked with blowing up tanks. Some of the major criticisms of meritocracy will be directed at academic merit, and I agree with those criticisms. I'll give a business world analogy. A business may hire someone with five years of experience, with no degree, or someone who spent five years getting a college degree. Academic merit would be the latter. Displayed merit would be the former. Now, I don't align myself with any one school of thought, because I don't think doing so is healthy. I have no alignment to a meritocratic party, so don't lump me in with the British meritocracy party or Singapore. I see issues with both. However, I think meritocracy gives me the best template to start off with, at this time, for the issues we currently face. I call myself a meritocrat because calling myself a Balthasar 34570 is silly, and I don't have a legitimate name to encompass my ideas, and I think that the problems with meritocracy can be addressed easier than with other alternatives, thus giving me a template to work with. And that's part of the goal, create a system of government capable of adapting to remove its own flaws. Meritocracy has some adaptation advantages, therefore it's my starter kit, basically. But still, I can't really call myself a meritocrat and have the statement be completely true. I have no legitimate alignment that I've found, just aspects that I lean on more than others. So the way the videos that are of a political nature are going to work is I'm going to tell you what I'd like to do and why, and it's not going to be aligned with any sort of party. So my goal when it comes to the topic of a nation would be to build a nation that's capable of indefinite survival while thriving. A short-term goal would be to build one capable of lasting for 500 years. And that would mainly be in the interest of securing more time to create one capable of perpetual survival. To define it as thriving, it needs to be making forward progress while providing a dependable standard of living for its people. Now by taking this view, you detach yourself from much of morality. Some people mistake that for utilitarianism. While some ideas are similar to compare it to utilitarianism, the idea of being utilitarian is to totally remove any and all moral concepts, including those of practical value. The classic argument against utilitarianism on moral grounds is that if a healthy person walked into a hospital, he should be killed and have his organs harvested to safeify the need of a liver, heart, etc. I would argue against it on practical grounds because if our society suddenly imposed that kind of a rule, the result would be that no one would go to a hospital and most would leave the country to seek medical treatment elsewhere if possible. This would then result in a much more weakened medical industry than we already have, among other severe drawbacks. The idea of meritocracy, or at least my version, in the context of a nation is to practically build the best society, what society is capable of surviving and thriving forever. How can you realistically expect to beat the sands of time? And if you can't, how close can you get? How far can we really go? How can we take the system to its maximum potential? 
By having that goal, you may also qualify as a transhumanist or a pragmatist, and in my case, I qualify as both. But like meritocrats, there are different ones with different points of view. I was led to meritocratic views via practicality, so technically you could identify me as a pragmatist, a transhumanist, and a meritocrat. And each one would be somewhat correct, but not fully correct. I'm about what's practical. I currently think meritocracy is the practical solution, therefore I am closest to being a meritocrat. At least for now. Now most people are okay with my morality so far, because most people don't think it's okay to kill people and steal their organs just because they were healthy. However, it also means that I don't perceive very much as inherently special or sacred. A lot of Americans wave the constitutional rights around on the grounds that they are the constitutional rights and therefore sacred. And I don't believe humans have any sort of sacred national heritage. And I don't think people should say they need something because it's sacred or traditional. What I would argue is that, well, the Founding Fathers created certain rights for a reason and turning our backs to their advice may be unwise. So I don't support the Constitution because it's the Constitution. I support it because I think what it says has a causal link to maintaining a society. This also means that I don't much value ethnic pride or national pride. I think that if someone is proud of something and attributes pride to themselves, they should have accomplished something worth being proud of. Being born into a nation or into a skin color is something that happens randomly, not something you work for and achieve. Therefore, I perceive it as having low value. And here's where we start having conflict. A lot of people go, well, you should be proud to be an American. America is the greatest country, blah, 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 blah. You know what? America needs to stop saying that it's the greatest country and start acting like it. And that applies to the citizenry, too, who seem to expect a sense of deserved national pride with little to no effort or participation on their part. And that's so not a problem just in the United States. That's a problem all over the world. No one so far has pointed out to me a legitimate reason to be proud of random chance, and I think that if we're going to define America as great, or any country as great, it should be manufacturing greatness for us to point to, because history would dictate that a generation whose main source of pride comes from the achievements of their ancestors are on their way to their own doom unless they produce something great themselves. Now, I'll give an example of what a more meritocratic America might resemble. We recently had an election, so I'll use that. Meritocracy is leadership by those who to lead, and by extension, voting by those who to vote. And this is the side that people view as unfair. Most people in the Western world seem to view voting as something they are entitled to by merit of existing, not because they're an informed voter, but simply because they exist, and due to existing, they have an entitlement to use an unresearched and unsupported opinion to participate in influencing the actions of the government. Democracy might support this. Meritocracy would disagree. So what's more meritocratic change? Well, currently, if you're born in the United States and reach a certain age, you're basically given the right to vote. However, we make immigrants take citizenship tests. I wonder how well American citizens that were born here do on those same tests. Personally, I think that instead of being freely issued the voting right just because you were born here, you should have to take the same citizenship test that we make immigrants take, and earn the right to vote. I don't think being born in the United States makes anyone special or imbues them with magical critical thinking skills as our system would imply. Our system believes that anyone born in the United States is visited by a fairy and magically granted certain skills. I think this is superstitious. I think that someone born here should pass a citizenship test in order to vote, and those that can't pass should not gain voting rights. Some people think that's unfair. I don't. You can disagree, but I've yet to be given a reason as to why it's unfair that didn't rely on a concept of entitlement. America is not the only nation to practice selective voting entitlements, and I condemn the belief in magical fairies worldwide, not just for the United States. When people argue in favor of selective voting entitlement in any nation, it's usually done for the purpose of artificially creating a sense of superiority and pride for the people born in that nation. They're born somewhere and are being given something as a result, therefore they feel special. It's also used to foster a sense of inclusion and community and create the perception of us and them, which is done to you to make you more loyal. I don't think either mindset is fitting for a nation's long-term survival. I see it as damaging to the critical thinking skills and rationality of the citizenry. It's a slow-burning problem. Maybe it'll avoid causing major issues for a couple generations, but tack on a few hundred years and you'll see things deteriorate, like they are for the United States right now. People can whine about how I'm not making people feel special about their nationality. I don't think that making them feel special because of where they were born is a good idea in the long run. You may view my willingness to tell them that they're too stupid to vote and need to get smarter to be unkind, but... The fact is that the universe we live in isn't kind, and history will devour this country and all its people mercilessly if steps are not taken to prevent that, just as it would devour any other country, just as it has devoured nations throughout history, many of whom made similar mistakes. We don't have the option to lower the bar just to make people feel better about themselves. Making the test easier will result in severe long-term costs, and that result is unacceptable to me. So I vote to make people smarter. And that's what led me to viewing meritocracy as the right way to go. Those in history with a lot of success often had meritocratic values. Specifically, what I refer to is displayed meritocracy, or at least what I call displayed meritocracy. Genghis Khan would be a prime example. How I'd structure the country's citizenship is a topic for a future video, but the punchline is, if you're too dumb to drive a car and smash into walls repeatedly, you're not getting the driver's license until you L2 drive, nub. And I think that if we keep lowering the bar and said, you know what, it's okay to drive drunk, you don't need to learn to drive, you can have a license anyway, 
people are going to keep crashing more and more. We're not going to make the test easier so more people can have an ego boost. We're not going to lower the bar. And in the case of what I'm recommending, that being that all U.S. citizens, myself included, should take a citizenship test once they reach voting age, that bar is actually being raised significantly. And if that means 50% of Americans can't vote because 50% can't understand that the Earth is not flat, so be it. The concept of democracy in its purest form is that if over 50% of people agree, it's the right idea. And it doesn't matter if the majority is intelligent or informed. I've seen this result in disaster too often to place my seal of approval on the magic 51% approval rating. And upon examination, the concept of make as many people happy as possible is self-defeating in the long run because the population will continue to divide since not everyone agrees on every issue. Democracy is about postponing that inevitable downfall. A forward-moving democracy can only exist with an informed citizenry. If it doesn't have one, it can't move forward. So I'd say we need to be more meritocratic and make the people smarter. It's a means to address these issues. We don't have an intelligent and informed citizenry. Okay, we'll make an intelligent and informed citizenry. That basically sums up the direction you'll see my videos come from. How can we build the best nation in the long term? What's the most practical outcome? What's a realistic outcome? They're about solving these problems. Now, I noticed that that's not common in commentaries. People usually criticize something and gain lots of support for criticizing it, but no one wants to put forward an alternative solution, and I think I know why. There's two reasons that I see. The first is that if an option turns out wrong, people don't want to be responsible, because our society stigmatizes experimentation. A scientist can't take it upon himself to see what will happen without an army of people attempting to discredit him if the experiment has negative results, even if he predicted it would. The second is that people fear change. People are afraid of not knowing what will happen, and most seem to prefer remaining in a bad situation while progressing to a worse situation as a valid alternative to taking the opportunity to attempt to repair the sinking ship. That's not going to happen very much in my series. If I criticize something, I'll probably have a solution of some form put forward to repair it. The way I see it is, it's easy to criticize, it's hard to actually go do something, so if all you do is criticize, your opinion doesn't hold much value. What I expect the result will be is that a lot of people fearing change will attempt to point out minute problems that have obvious fixes, deliberately ignore those fixes, and attempt to use said minute problems as justification to keep things the way they are and maintain the status quo deterioration. I see this happen constantly on virtually every topic. Hey, we need food. Let's go to the store. We shouldn't go to the store, because it might rain. Why don't you just put a coat on? No, 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 no. Too hard. Not my style. Not my style. I'm well aware that by putting forward a solution opens the possibility that someone will later contradict me and manage to sway my opinion. I find people throwing rationality to the wind in order to preserve the status quo to be a much more common outcome, but I'll admit it is possible. I don't find it likely, but it is possible. Hakuna Matata. So let's see where we go. You know the direction these videos will come from, you know generally what they'll contain, and if you don't like it, well, no one's holding a gun to your head and forcing you to watch. If that content interests you, stick around. Let's see what happens. Maybe there is an audience for me. Maybe people will be interested in hearing what I have to say. Hopefully we'll be able to get some decent discussions going in the comments section. Let's see what happens. Let's find out. I'll see you next time.